We acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this podcast is recorded. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and to Aboriginal elders emerging. The following podcast contains content of a graphic, violent nature and is not suitable for children. Tell me why you're bringing this application today. Um, because I'm constantly getting abusive messages and there's been a lot of verbal abuse throughout our relationship and I'm fearful that he could come to my house at any time and be abusive. I'll just take you through this statement, Miss Costigan. You say in your um, statement that there was an incident when uh, you were pregnant with your latest child yep. um, where he um, called you a slut, a liar, a cheat. You say he threw a lamp from the bedside table and broke it and then came out into the lounge room and leaned over you, being abusive and telling you to crash into a tree. Is that correct? And then you write that on the 29th of January there was another incident. Were you still together at that stage? Yes, you were. Okay. So you were heavily pregnant at that stage. Is that correct? And then you said you won't let him be threatened and he then cracked his knuckles and spat at you and told you, and I'll quote, shut the up before it is the last thing you say. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And that was the early hours of the morning on the 29th? Yep. That's a recording of Canberra woman Tara Costigan applying for a domestic violence order, or DVO, at the ACT Magistrates Court. It was February 2015 and she was holding her seven-day-old baby as she made her statement. She said her ex-partner Marcus Rappel had never been physically violent, but his verbal and emotional abuse was escalating and she was afraid of him. The next day, he forced his way into her home and murdered her in front of her two sons while she was holding their baby. This is Australian True Crime with Michelle Laurie and Emily Webb. Come with us as we go beyond the news cycle to find out how people become killers, how people become victims, and what happens next. Later in the show, we'll hear from Tara's Aunt Maria about that terrible day and the aftermath. Writer Heidi Lemon has worked closely with Tara's family to write a book called The First Time He Hit Her, and she joined me to talk about it. Firstly, I asked Heidi to tell me what she learned about Tara Costigan. Tara was a very inspiring young mother, deeply devoted to her two young sons. At one point, she was working three jobs in order to give them the best lifestyle that she possibly could. Her grandmother and aunt described her as mischievous, bubbly, fun. She was very hardworking, very loyal. She was a genuinely beautiful soul. It's very hard to find someone to say a bad word against her. I, I was told over and over again what a beautiful heart she had and how much she meant to everyone who knew her. There had been some stops and starts in her young life. Her parents, Tony Costigan and Trish, they were young when they had her and look, the relationship didn't. The relationship did. founded, yeah. When Tara was seven and a half years old, her father suicided. Um, there was a point when Tara was just entering adulthood when she decided to cut contact with her mother. I do want to emphasise that Trish, Tara's mother, loves her daughter so much and is racked with grief. There was a point when Tara was entering adulthood at which she decided to cut contact with her mother whereupon she became extremely close with Margaret Costigan, her grandmother, and Maria Costigan, her aunt. They lived in close proximity to one another and they saw each other regularly. Previous to meeting Marcus, Tara worked in aged care. She was a really devoted mum. She had a very supportive family. People loved her. She was living independently, paying her own way and everything. How did she and Marcus meet? Yeah, there's conflicting stories about how they met. One version has them meeting through a dating site. This version is based on her grandmother's very distinct memory of Tara explaining that that's how they met. 
And another, probably a bit more common recollection and version of events is that they met through a mutual friend. Was it problematic from the start? No, no. There was a there was an idyllic period. Tara was ecstatic. She was smitten. She was, you know, on cloud nine and she just thought Marcus was it. It was everything. She was just walking on sunshine. And by all accounts, Tara's family recall Marcus as being as trying very hard to be what Tara needed him to be, a, a good, stable, solid figure. He tried hard to establish a relationship with her sons. They established a, a rapport. There was a lot of joy in the beginning by all accounts. But it is also important to note that we can't know for sure when the trouble did start because that is something that Tara was not keen to announce to anyone. When Tara met Marcus, he was 39 years old. He was a tradesman who ran his own bricklaying business. He was, according to some people, arrogant, came off as self-assured, wasn't a huge talker in a lot of social situations, very insecure. And my research shows that he struggled with depression, anxiety. He had a history of suicidal thoughts. Interestingly, he considered himself too cowardly to actually end his own life. He'd always had difficulty controlling his temper, but after he began to use anabolic steroids and ice in 2014, his rages became more and more difficult for him to control. It's not something that you reveal easily, is it, to family and loved ones? And from what you discovered and from what was in court and from the family, what was the nature of the the abuse towards Tara? Tara suffered a lot of verbal abuse and emotional abuse, quite devastating verbal abuse. And one of the first instances which she would eventually document in her DBO application was, it was actually early in 2015. So they had been together a few weeks. It was the night her grandfather had died and she was distraught and she was weeping in the bathroom And Marcus came and stood in the door and apparently just went to town. He just verbally lacerated her, telling her what a slut she was. In Tara's words, in the DVO application, he was telling her she was a slut with a huge box. Yeah, All these revolting attacks. It's a haunting image of her curled up on the bathroom floor, weeping. Tara and Marcus had an extremely troubled relationship for months prior to their split. Marcus told Tara that he would like to reinstigate communication with Kira, his ex-partner with whom he had a child. He hadn't met his child before because Kira herself had put a DBO on Marcus at the end of their relationship. Tara acquiesced to Marcus's request that she wasn't thrilled about the contact with Kira kicking off again but she allowed it. She wanted Marcus, who had been acting with extreme volatility in recent times, she wanted to try to settle him down and she hoped that by allowing him to reconnect with his former partner and meeting their child together, that this would settle Marcus down a bit. Marcus had been in communication with Kira while Tara was heavily pregnant with their child. In early 2015, Tara had a had opportunity, I guess, to look at Marcus's phone and discovered texts between Marcus and Kira that revealed that their communications were a lot less innocent than she had hoped. Uh, Tara briefly ended the relationship, but Tara was obviously in an extremely vulnerable position. She was eight months pregnant with his child and desperately wanted this relationship to work. She was prepared to try again, as she always had been. Briefly, the relationship continued until one night. This was late January. Marcus became very abusive verbally. This really terrified Tara and marked the end of their relationship. The night that Tara gave birth to her and Marcus's daughter was also the night that Marcus discovered that he was going to be a father again. Kira contacted him. Marcus, who had only recently left Tara and started seeing Kira again, now learned that Kira had fallen pregnant with his child. He learned that she was pregnant with his child the same night 
but Tara delivered his baby. A few nights later, Marcus had broadened his campaign of harassment against Tara to include her grandmother and her aunt. He was sending text messages to them, particularly to Margaret, the grandmother. Tara realised at this point that she was going to need to apply for a domestic violence order the next day. The 27th of February, she went to the courthouse, got into the witness stand and made her application. Marcus showed the application to Kira. Kira went through the order and discovered where Tara made reference to the fact that Marcus had visited her on a couple of occasions. Kira had been under the impression that Marcus was somewhere else at that time. She was enraged and told Marcus that she couldn't be with him anymore, that she couldn't be in a relationship that was based on lies. Marcus's mood began to deteriorate. He ripped up the DBO and threw it out the window. He said, this is lies, half of this is lies. He drove to Bunnings and purchased an axe. He would later claim that he was going to buy materials to end his life, a rope or a hose, but that he saw the axe and bought it with the intention to chop up Tara's furniture that belonged to him in her house. He drove to uh, the suburb of Corwell, where Tara lived, and drove up and down her street 13 times before finally turning into her driveway. He was actually on the phone to his sister at points while he was driving up and down the street. She would later tell the court that he was screaming, ranting, screaming. Uh, she could hardly understand what he was saying. And then suddenly all she could hear was the engine running and there was no, no Marcus anymore. And she thought he had had a stroke or something. But in fact, he had pulled up to Tara's door and jumped out with the axe and left the engine running. Tara's younger sister, Ricky, told ABC 730 Report what happened next. It was probably about, I don't know, 3, 340, and then I heard a smash of a window or something, and I thought it was, might have been the boys kicking a ball and put it through the window and they would get in trouble for it. But uh, once I walked out, it wasn't until I seen the boys running towards me, screaming. I looked at the door and I noticed that, and then Tara came in from her bedroom, and then I seen Marcus behind her. He was just screaming. An axe in his hand, Marcus was chasing Tara, who was cradling her baby in her arms. Instinctively, Ricky Schmidt reached out to protect her sister. He tried I to grab tried her. to grab her to move her close to me and to get into the laundry, um, into my bedroom. But as I put my hands on Tara, that's when he swung and hit us. Hit at like swung and hit us both. Um, and from there, Tara fell to the ground. Marcus Rappel had sliced into the back of Tara's neck. He hit Ricky's little finger, severing a tendon. At that point, I grabbed my phone and called triple zero, and I told them what was going on. Can you please explain to me how it happened? Did my, my sister's ex-boyfriend tell me to get out with an app? What injuries does she have? She's got an app wound on her neck. OK, can you describe it in more detail, please? No, I don't. Ricky tried to staunch Tara's wounds to no avail. At one point, I told her that her boys were fine and that that was safe and that she didn't she didn't have to worry about them because I'd look after them. I told them that they loved her and that I did too. And it was a few seconds after that she mumbled something but I couldn't work out what it was. And then it was probably... Not even a minute after that, that she took her last breath. Can you please explain to me how it happened? Did my, my sister's ex-boyfriend tell me to get out with an app? What injuries does she have? She's got an app wound on her neck. OK, can you describe it in more detail, please? No, I don't. She's hardly breathing on her What was revealed to you about family violence. The figure that startled me the most came out of a 2018 report 
from the Australian Domestic and Family Violence Death Review Network. Nearly a quarter of Australian women murdered by their former or current partner had not suffered any physical violence in that relationship previously. Tara, being one of those 25%, she thought Marcus wasn't going to hurt her, let alone kill her, because he had, he never had in the past, as she told her uncle Michael the night before she was murdered. But, of course, the first time he hit her was the time he murdered her. If you or someone you know needs help, there's numbers you can call. These details will also be in our show notes. 1-800-RESPECT on 1-800-737-732. For a specialist LGBTIQ family violence service, call With Respect on 1800 542 847. Men's Referral Service on 1300 766 491. Lifeline 131 114. And Relationships Australia 1300 364 277. If you are in immediate danger, call police on triple zero. After the break, I talk to Tara's Aunt Maria, who tells us about the horrific legacy that Marcus Rappel's violence has had on Tara's family. Thank you so much. I know it's not easy to talk about this. Maria, can you tell us a bit about yourself and your niece, Tara? As Tara was growing up, she's always spent a lot of time with our family, more probably with my mum, although her two other siblings used to spend a lot of time with me. Uh, so she had quite a few siblings that we're all, we're all still close to nearly all of them. Anyhow, a lot of them still call me aunt. Tara was with mum a lot. And then when Tara was pregnant with her second boy, that's when I started playing a huge part in Tara's life and more of a mother figure then because we worked together and everything at that stage. She was living in Queen Deanne. She didn't have a car. She started working at the same place I was working and then, then she moved into town, which just made it heaps easier, into Canberra. Yeah, we were just always together. I mean, we walked the dogs together. Her place was in a suburb right next to mine, but we could walk to each other's places without having to cross any roads. And, in fact, when our dogs ran away, they would run away to each other's places and the boys would spend a lot of time. And I've got a daughter that is also the same age as Tara's second boy. And so am I correct in saying that Tara's father was your brother? Tara's father was my brother. His name was Tony and he was... 14 months younger than me, and he committed suicide when he was 29 years old, and Tara, I think, was seven. Your family's very tight-knit and extremely supportive of Tara. What kind of person was Tara? What was life like before she met Marcus Rappel? Tara had just bought her first car. She was a very hard worker. She, single mum, but tried to give the best she possibly can to her boys. So she worked in aged care and she also worked doing some cleaning. She also worked with a very close friend of ours doing hairdressing. Her name was Don, but he started to alienate people. And the first person he alienated was Don, the lady that she worked with with the hairdresser and then I was the next one. But to look, prior to that, super bubbly, becoming incredibly confident within her own skin, um, happy doing what she was doing, just really blossoming into a... <clears throat> Oh, into just an amazing, strong, independent woman. She was beautiful. Look, she, was, she wasn't she was perfect, don't get me wrong. You know, like she had a wild side and I think the, the second boy is a lot like her as well. But she was just all about having fun. She had lots of close girlfriends that she used to go out with. She had, you know, one very, very special friend, Sam, who is in the book, and I think they were just together 
you know, for a long, long time, even when uh, she was estranged from people, you know, Sam was still a part of her life and that, but always doing things, always doing things for the boys, you know, and, oh, look, I was alienated from her for three months prior to her death and 25th of January she eventually contacted me and we reconnected but even then she'd kind of changed she was a different she was a different person in what way had she changed maria from what you knew her as she because she was so confident and and so self-assured and she'd lost that she was she was vulnerable she didn't have that same confidence in herself that she had before she was with Marcus. And so you reconnected really just not long before she was murdered. Yeah, that's right, on the 25th of January. Looking back or just reflecting on it, did you have any inkling that the relationship was not going well or was she quite reluctant to talk to her close family about it? I think towards the end she was definitely reluctant and that was the reason I was pushed out. I, in I think it was November, got a message from Tara, this long-winded message basically saying that I undermine her authority as a mother because the boys, you know, when things got tough and that, the boys would come and stay with me. And, of course, I'm going to be there for them and, of course, I'm going to have an, an open door for them. But, you know, every child needs to have somebody beside their parent that can provide them with that support. But I got this message and I looked at it and I thought, that's not Tara. That is definitely not Tara. Prior to that, there wasn't much I didn't know about Tara and her relationship. I saw problems... Right at the beginning, within the first few months of those two going out together, we used to take long walks all the time with the dogs. And this one afternoon, we walked, I think, for about three or four hours just around the whole Tuggeranong area. And her thing that she was saying, you know, she wasn't quite sure whether she should keep going with the relationship because when he was good, he was good. And when he was bad, he was bad, you know. What did you know of their destructive behaviour? Did she talk to you about that? Oh, yeah, definitely. But the boys also spoke to me as well. And I started recording. I just started writing things down. Whatever I heard, whatever the boys would tell me, I would start writing things down. But he did at one stage come down rambling on about Tara being mentally ill and she was a liar and she had admitted to being a liar. But what had happened was because all his rampages seemed to be at night, or well, that's when they seemed to be worse, just the ramblings and he would go on and on and on. But she was pregnant, she was tired, so she said, yes, okay, I'm a liar, I'm a liar. So he just went with that and she just said, yeah, I did say that because I'd had enough, I just wanted to go to sleep, so I agreed. Um, but there were many things. There was he was he was so paranoid. He was paranoid. I mean, I was very protective of Tara, and she didn't have a father that could stand up and say, "Hey, mate, you do the right thing by my daughter, or or there's going to be trouble." So that was me. <laughs> that was my job. I was just doing Tony's job. I didn't care who it was, whether this guy was a Ubiut Trady or whoever he was, I don't, I don't care what position they hold. For me, she was my daughter and you do the right thing by her. And he didn't like that. And I did know a lot of what was going on, so I, I needed to be expelled from her life. He had a relationship with another lady and she fell pregnant and then she got a DVO on him. Tara knew about this and this is when Tara's hairdressing friend said, you know, that's that's a red flag. You know, where are you going here? Maybe you shouldn't be going here. Then they got together 
and the baby was born and she was always saying, look, you know, try and connect, you know, try and do the right thing, try and be in contact because she just wanted what was best for the child, the other child, as well as what would make him happy. So she went along with it. Then she became pregnant. Maybe the DVO had fallen by the wayside. And then he reconnected with her. And so there was just a lot going on. And then she fell pregnant. So when Tara gave birth, well, mum and I actually found out that the girlfriend, the other girlfriend was pregnant and Tara didn't know anything about it. So we weren't sure about saying anything and then thought, well, if she heard it from somebody else and knew that we knew, especially mum and I, she would be really disappointed. So we told her. So it was just backwards and forwards with him. I I think he probably would have been happy if he could just have both of them, (laughs) but clearly that was never going to be a thing. So he had a child with the previous partner and then they'd reconnected, then she'd got pregnant again. Tara did sound like she really wanted him to have a relationship with his child from that relationship. Yeah, exactly. So for her thought was that their baby would be a half-sister to the other baby. So, you know, and she's got lots of half-sisters and half-brothers and, you know, but it doesn't matter, they're still family. They don't they don't consider themselves halves. They're full. And she would consider that her daughter also had blood somewhere else, you know, a, a blood brother, a blood sister. When Tara had her daughter, her and Marcus's daughter, was their relationship over? Oh well, yeah, it was definitely over. From so Tara reconnected with me on the twenty fifth. It was a Wednesday night that she just said I cannot, this was before she had her baby, their baby, she just said, I cannot bring a child into this environment. I just can't do it. And that was that was the end. And it was really hard because she adored him. She loved him so much. So it was a huge decision. It was very hard. And the thing is that throughout the whole pregnancy, he kept on saying it wasn't mine, it wasn't mine anyhow, even right up to when he went, to jail because they did a DNA test in the jail because, you know, one minute he said it was his, the next he didn't. So, and we all knew it definitely was, but um, their relationship was definitely over by that stage. Well, he'd already started back with the other lady. You know, you think with family violence or intimate partner violence, you think, oh, well, there must be a build-up to it. And in Tara's case, I mean, the book that Heidi Lemon has written is called The First Time He Hit Her. And in fact, the reason for that is that the first time Marcus Rappel hit Tara was when he murdered her. Correct. Yes. He'd not hit her before, ever. He'd lost his temper. He'd smashed things. He was very verbally abusive, but never put his hand on her. He spat at her at one stage as well. Tara applied for a domestic violence order really days before she was murdered. Were you with her when she was applying for it? The week before, exactly a week before, she was taken into the ACT courts and was going to apply for a DV order, but she went into labour. So her stepdad, Mark, took her to the hospital Prior to going into the courts on the first time, I actually took her into Tuggeranong Police Station because I knew what she needed to do, but it had to be of her own accord. So I'd spoken to her numerous times. I'd spoken to the police prior to taking her in there. I'd spoken to a few other people and they basically said, as sad as it sounds, we are reactive rather than proactive. But it had to be of her own doing. It had to be her that had to go in and get it. So I took her in there and the young policeman there, I didn't say anything. She did the talking and he said, I'm advising you to go and get a domestic violence order, ASAP. And then I took her straight in to the courts. 
initially she sent me a message and saying, I want you to. And I said, are you sure you want me or do you want mum to do it? She said, no, I don't want to put Nan through this. I want you to do it. And I said, I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm totally fine with that. I'll do whatever you need to do. Then the day before it happened, I took her into the courts and then we took her out to get the baby uh, birth certificate done as well after the court case. So, you know, and you know, it wasn't something that she wanted to do at all because she didn't want to cause him any problems. But everything else that was going around, the social worker, the young police officer, it just said, this is what you need to do, convinced her. I knew she had to do it, but she needed to hear it from other people, not me. She knew that he would be extremely angry that she'd taken out the DVO, but what he did to her, no one could have predicted that, could they? Or could you in hindsight? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. And I, I guess there's always... Because he'd only ever been verbal, but I do believe that statistics are once the relationship ends, that is actually a, a very bad time. That's that's not a good time for people. Yeah, it's, it's really, yeah, it's one of the most unsafe times for women and children when they're getting out of the relationship. I actually stayed at my mum's place at Tara's Nan's the night before I didn't normally sleep over so I took her into the hospital we spent pretty much the whole night there and then we came home and mum was just sitting in the chair and I was just laying on the ground and um, just you know snoozing on the ground in near mum and I got a phone call from Ricky saying Tara needs you, Tara needs you. And and then that was pretty much it. So I just jumped into the car and I raced straight over there. On the way there, because I lived so close to her, I rang my young son, Damien, and I said, Damo, you need to get around to Tara's now. And he said, why? I said, don't ask why, just go. So he left. I hung, hung up and I was driving down the road and I actually followed the ambulance all the way to her place. And when I got there, I saw what had happened. Damien was already there. That's um, My son Damien was already there. Ricky and Bryce were standing at the front door. Marcus had one knee down. He hadn't, he hadn't been handcuffed then and he had a, a police a policeman standing over him. He was yelling out, carrying on. I wasn't quite sure exactly what he was saying. And then Damo yelled out, you better not have fucking done anything, mate. You better not have fucking done anything. And he looked up and he looked at me and he said, you instigated this. And then he just started getting really angry. I'm not quite sure what happened then because at that stage, Ricky was at the front door yelling for me and then another policeman came over and asked asked who I was because Ricky wanted to come out to me. So they said that I could go in. So I walked in the door and I just wanted to know where the kids were and Ricky said they're safe, they're safe. And then I looked over to the laundry door and I saw Tara laying down there. The ambulance were there, but (laughs) Ricky was just a mess. I'm kind of thankful. I'm just thankful Ricky was there, but she was so, she's so young. She's so traumatised as well. And then I was just with Ricky and Bryce Roll. You know, some of it is just really hard to even remember. I just wanted to know where the kids were. Uh, so I then went out the back, which is in the unit out the back, and that's where the kids were. So I went there and then the boys just clung to me. I think initially the boys just assumed that I would be taking them and, and I think everybody assumed that I would take Ayla as well. But, you know, for a start, that was never going to happen anyhow. But 
and they tried to keep the kids together. The police needed to interview the boys. And then by that time, my eldest son, Nathan, was there. And Nathan's quite a big fella. So both Drew and Riley clung to my eldest son, Nathan. I think it was more that they felt safer with him because he was so big. And so he went in with the boys when the police were interviewing the boys about it. And then everything was, it was just, I, I think I ended up going into the police station after that, but I remember an alleyway in between both the houses, the house where Tara was murdered and the house where the boys were being held at the time and everybody was congregating. And I just went in to the middle of that laneway and uh, it just wailed. I just, <laughs> I just couldn't believe. I, I, I just couldn't believe what had happened. And I think being, you know, maybe the older female in the family, I was I was just kind of on autopilot for so long doing things and, and trying to sort out everything um, and how much, you know, needed to be sorted out after that. The fact that Tara had been attacked, her newborn baby in her arms, her children there so violently, I think that hers was one of the cases that had started that groundswell of more understanding about family violence. Well, I think, like you were saying, there were a lot of cases around that time. There was definitely another one seven days after Tara, but the family didn't want it out in the open. They just didn't want it in the media. But for us, we were just, you know, Tara wasn't a nobody. She was a somebody and she was always the one that was the light of the party. So we did it for her because we knew that she she loved being at the forefront of people talking about her. That's just who Tara was. I mean, she'd see a mirror, see a window and start looking at herself, you know. She, <laughs> that's the sort of person she was. You know, we talk a lot about the ripple effect of crime and you spoke about Tara's children. Oh, absolutely. But the, the mental, you know, the mental damage that has been done, the emotional damage that's been done to all of them, all of them, including, including the baby. The baby knows what's going on. So... You know, it it has, it's had a shocking ripple effect. You know, for mum and I, we've always said we didn't just lose Tara that day, we lost her children as well. The children are living with their, well, the baby is living with her maternal side, uh, so Tara's aunt, and the boys are with their father. So we weren't a part of their lives prior to, and we can't really inject ourselves into their lives and you know let's be honest teenage boys really don't want to hang out with a couple of old ladies do they (laughs) but in saying that I know that well I believe that they'll come in the future because we have so much information on Tara you know when she first walked when she first talked we've got photos we've got oh like so many photos it's not funny but my mum's got she remembers dates <laughs> and she writes everything down. So the kids in the future will be able to come to mum and I, uh, especially mum, and find out all that information. We've got, a, you know, like Tara's school reports, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, know who their mum was. Exactly. Yeah, and Tara's own mother, she's lost her daughter. I think family members get forgotten a bit. Like even you saying that you were doing all the practical stuff, sorting things out, I mean, that takes a lot of energy. Like even, you know, like bank accounts, she didn't have a will, so it was bank accounts. She was in a rental property, so we had to organise all that sort of stuff. We had to get the furniture out. I actually helped Marcus's mother get rid of all Marcus's stuff as well. And, you know, it's tough for Tara's sisters and DJ, who was very close and was there with Tara, on the day that she died and it's rocked their worlds as well. It's just rocked so many worlds and it's changed. But 
I know that Tara is up there, and this is just my belief, that Tara's up there with her pop, whom she adored, her father, her uncle, her nan, all these people that she spent heaps of time with, and I know that she would not want people to be wallowing and not living their own lives. That's I know that she would want people to move on. And we can't. We we have we have to move on. We can't just stop. Did you think that when Marcus received his sentence and he got a fairly lengthy sentence, did that give any relief at all to the family or was it just more the feeling like, right, he's punished, we don't have to think about him, but it's hard not to think about him? I guess we all probably wanted life, but life without parole. And that's really just not something that really happens. And apart from that, as soon as they admit guilt, even though it took him a year and a half or a year or so to to admit to it, they get an automatic 25%, I think it is. They get automatically off anyhow. So he was never going to get a life sentence, which we knew. So, And potentially his... Uh, non-parole period is longer than life in some aspects anyhow and you know he's still a troublemaker I'm not quite sure I don't waste any energy worrying or thinking about him Um, but I know he's not doing great and to me I, I, I just don't waste any energy thinking about him whether it be negative or positive I think it's tough for his family as well, um, tough for his mother, tough for his, you know, both his sisters, and I guess tougher for them too because he's moved further away. But I don't think he wanted them to come and visit anyhow. Apparently, um, so. You know, I just, I, I don't even like to think about him. What have you learned or what would you want to tell other women, girls, about this? I've just noticed the new ads on TV, the ones where, oh, I'm just looking at a phone, he's doing that just because. And it's that, it's that control. It's, and, it, and it grows so slowly that you probably don't even realise it. Look, this is something that has been happening for years and I believe it's probably going to take years for it to change. But I really do think we're on the right path. I also think that we need to consider doing help for the perpetrators as well. You can't just get help for one side. You've got to get help for both sides, I believe, anyhow. I think the book's really powerful and you participated in the book, didn't you, in information and interviews? Oh, yeah. Definitely. And how did you feel about that process? What was that like for you? Um, there were things that I probably didn't want to say because at the time I was working in corrections, so I had to be mindful, and I was actually working in the same jail where he was housed, so I had to be mindful of uh, what I was saying. But I am rather impressed with the book. I think... Heidi has pretty much got it spot on and I think it really does, like people are reading it, really does open your eyes up to that psychological abuse and I think it potentially opens up people's eyes to so much more. Oh, look, I think it's it's been a big thing for me because uh, even though I wasn't, her mother. I mean, it's been really hard, but I think having this book come out will maybe be just time to let go. And I don't say you move on because, well, you do move on, but you never, ever forget. There will always be an empty space in all our hearts because of who Tara was, because she was a big personality. She was a chocolate thief, <laughs> um, you know, and she she was just so much fun. 
she was so much fun. And still, you know, like she wasn't the perfect little girl, but I think she did really well. She did really well, you know, providing for her boys, giving them the best of the best. She sent them to private schools. You know, I just think we're all really quite proud of what Tara did in that short space of time that she lived. You know, in that 28 years, she really did do some wonderful things and um, just, a, you know, a great mother. I don't know if it's because I work in corrections but I, and maybe listening to lots of true crime podcasts. Um, so I actually am able to talk about it um, and that's what people would say at corrections. They were, how do you do this? How do you work in the same place? where he's housed well, for a start I don't have a choice but I want him to know I'm I'm up here he's down there he's yeah so I just I just am able to talk about it I think when I was really really young I cried all my tears so I have none left <laughs> Thank you for downloading this episode of Australian True Crime, made in association with the ACAS Creator Network. Thank you to our patrons, Bianca Vergau, Karen Jacobs, Ms. Lizlu, Alexandra Atak, Liz, Brad W, Isla Louise, Kelly Vance, Alana Khan, Kaz Banks, Kate Stollery, Jennifer Lee and Michaela Cockshell. Thank you. We can't do this podcast without your support. Welcome to ACAST Recommends. Every week, we pick some of our favourite shows and this is one we think you're going to love. How did farmers defeat the world's biggest empire? What's up with the Northern Irish border? And how does such a small country have such a big influence? The history of Ireland tells the story of the founding of the Irish Republic, one packed full of assassins, spying secretaries, school teachers and British soldiers. 100 years on, the story of how Ireland became Ireland has never been more relevant. Search for the History of Ireland in your podcast app today. Acast is home to the biggest podcasts from Australia and around the world. Subscribe to this show and hundreds more now via Acast or wherever you get your podcasts.